Will Smith. The police last night identified the dead bandit as 18-year-old permanent port tab called Mikey. They both, the robbery occurred at about 9.15 a.m. Initial investigations revealed that the businessman, 31, went to his jewelry store at about 7.30 a.m. And about 9.15, he was pounced upon by the bandits while attending to customers. Potab had a cutlass and his accomplice had a gun. The businessman's employee was injured after he was attacked. What took place at St. Joseph High? So many other schools Things are not reaching to your ears or to your office because the head teachers, some of them are hiding these things from you. If you go to Westminster School on the West Coast, that new school that recent uh, opened up a couple of years ago, there's some kind of stabbing, some kind of um, cuss out and fight and big fights going on. In Vreden Hoop Primary School, grade six girls are molesting grade three girls. And that is just some sum that I'm calling. And people, parents. Blue STR blue string bag. A blue string. And made good their escape on foot. The businessman raised an alarm and the persons in the market confronted the bandits who discharged three rungs in their direction, hitting one of the persons on his right leg and left thigh. Partab, who was armed with a cutlass and had the blue bag with the stolen jewelry, was confronted by several persons in the market who managed to disarm him, take the bag away, and handed it over to the police. And handed it it over to the police, handed it over. Now there's somebody, there's a second truck run overboard by um, Kupu Carrier, so Bangladesh truck by driver man safe over there. Well, that's the most important thing. Hey, 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 in front, get it, in front, get it, no thing, man, in front, in front, in the middle. Rest the man with the pin. Lose the big one, lose the fine one. Blood for the child. There is somebody child. There is me belly. There is me baby. Nobody not traveling. Bad one. Nobody good one. This when they did that to my son, he had not no weapon in his hand. He dropped every single thing and he ran. Oh, he run. They could have catch him and they could have put lash in him. But. Welcome back to the flight. Hit that subscription button, buddy. And stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Thanks. Business icon Chico Bihari, one of the pillars of the Bihari group of companies, has passed away. He was 82 years old. In a statement of his death, the Guyana Bank for Trade and Industry, one of the businesses within the group said, It is with great sadness that we at GBTI extend our heartfelt condolences to the Bihari family on the passing of Chico Bihari. Chico was not only a visionary leader, but also a cherished figure whose contributions to the business landscape of Guyana will forever be remembered. According to the bank, as a key pillar of the Bihari group, Chico's legacy of excellence, commitment, and service to the people of Guyana has left an indelible mark on our nation. His spirit of entrepreneurship and dedication to community upliftment has inspired many, and his loss will be deeply felt. Our thoughts and prayers are with his family, friends, and all those who had the privilege of knowing and working with him during this difficult time. May his soul rest in peace, the bank said. The Harry Group of companies established since 1935 comprises some of the most established and progressive businesses in Guyana and the region. Its operations include commercial and merchant banking, food manufacturing, margarine, butters, ice creams and detergents, insurance like fire, motor, marine in general, and automotive interests. The Bihari Group is a family business started six decades ago as a humble operation with just three employees. Today, staff population has grown. Continuing in the family tradition, three generations of Biharis now manage this conglomerate. 
family pride may have a lot to do with the continued success of the organization as the Bihari name is literally always on the line in every product and service offered to the public. The main union representing sugar workers in Guyana, the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union has sounded the alarm over the below-target sugar production. As of October 26, 2024, the Guyana Sugar Corporation had only produced 24,711 tons of sugar of the 63,276 tons set as the target for this year. The sugar produced so far for the year represents only 39% of the year's production target. In expressing concern about the low sugar production, GAW noted that as much as 60% of the cropping period has been exhausted and the union is apprehensive that the deficit cannot be closed in the remaining cropping weeks. GAW said the industry's sad situation cannot be delinked from the management of its cultivation and agricultural operations. GAW reminded that before the commencement of the current crop, it drew Guy Suko's attention to several important issues that required intervention. But its concerns were brushed aside. The union said while it has expressed concern about the production rate and trajectory, it seems that those charged with agricultural management in the industry have turned a blind eye to the concerns. Much of the reason why the recent St. Joseph High School toilet episode has not, relatively speaking, been made much of in the public domain has to do with the fact that these days, worse things happen at sea so to speak, as far as irregularities in the education sector are concerned, so much so that the reported St. Joseph incident goes down as yet another unappealing mark on the state education sector's chalkboard. After all, the school toilet incident has been preceded in the education sector by fights in school resulting in serious injuries, an out-of-control culture of in-school bullying, assaults by parents on teachers, and a swathe of other shockers that are now commonplace. Some of these match, and perhaps even surpass, the recent St. Joseph reported toilet incident. There are considerations that place restrictions on media coverage regarding just how much gets said about the matter at this stage. That said, there is no evading the fact that the necessity for the media to report on such matters underlines the extent of what is happening in the school system. The Ministry of Education in its current condition of leaden-footedness has to carry the can here. It is high time that it uses the tools at its disposal to make a far more diligent effort to rid the education system of the warts and boils that afflict it. If the task may not be theirs alone, it is for the ministry to mobilize and organize the resources to do so and to lead the way. The media ought not to afford the ministry a get out here. What the education ministry manifestly does not appear to understand is that salvaging the country's education system demands much more than what now appears to be a posture of indifference. In the instance of the St. Joseph toilet incident, there may well be a case to be made for addressing existing weak protocols associated with aspects of out-of-class, on-premises behavior in schools. And if this is so, it is a matter of putting measures in place to overcome that hurdle. This, of course, ought to be a shared responsibility involving as partners the ministry and the heads and teachers at the various schools. That said, the setting, and more importantly, enforcement of rules is much more easily said than done. And here one does not get the impression that the Ministry of Education is particularly adept at ensuring the stringent application of some of the rules which it sets, but which it appears to be less than diligent in ensuring enforcement. To gather evidence of this, one only has to observe the out-of-class regime at some schools, which, all too frequently, manifests itself in forms of behavior that sometimes comes across as a kind of completely overseen bedlam. One would think that issues like the supervision of break periods and the use of school toilets ought to fall under a certain minimum level of oversight for obvious reasons. The available evidence does not suggest that this applies. Where such strictures are not part of the wider regimen of in-school discipline in state schools, then it goes without saying that such measures should be realized forthwith. Say what you like about manpower deficiencies, unmonitored restrooms, as distinct from full-time policing of those facilities, in the state school system is not only unsatisfactory, it is, as we say in Guyana, asking for trouble. The country's education delivery system can only be said to be working efficiently 
when those out-of-classroom requisites that speak directly to a physically and emotionally convivial out-of-classroom environment are in place, functioning, and being appropriately overseen. Where, as is the case, such mechanisms are not in place, we should anticipate instances of anomalous behavior by the users of those facilities. The actions of the Ministry of Education often suggest that it subscribes to the position that if a problem is ignored for long enough, it will eventually go away. This is exactly the kind of approach that might cause the minister ministry to treat the St. Joseph occurrence as a kind of aberration that we will, in the fullness of time, put behind us. Such a posture of, in effect, trivializing what could turn out in the longer term to be a big problem in our school system is nothing short of sheer recklessness. The responsible thing to do here is to use the St. Joseph experience and apply it to making across-the-board adjustments to the protocols associated with the use of toilets, restrooms in the state school system. So as a citizen of this country, I am calling on the Honorable Priya Mani Chen, our education minister, to get involved in the school system more. What do I mean by this? I, I know you're seeing what is going on, in, in the school in terms of bullying and now you see what took place at St. Joseph High. So many other schools, things are not reaching to your ears or to your office because the head teachers, some of them are hiding these things from you. If you go to Westminster School on the West Coast, that new school that recent uh, opened up a couple years ago, there's some kind of stabbing, some kind of um, cuss out and fight and big fights going on in Vreden Hoop Primary School, grade six girls are molesting grade three girls. And that is just some sum that I'm calling. And people, parents are embarrassed to talk about and there was there that incident with the six grade six girl molesting, sexually molested a grade three girl in the toilet, in the washroom. That parents went into the school. And you know what the parent, the head teacher told the parents? Why didn't the little girl scream that maybe she was she was enjoying it? That she was liking it. That is why she didn't cry out for help. She didn't scream for help. What if the adults in the school cannot fight for these children? Some of y'all teachers, I'm gonna tell you straight up, even in St. Joseph High, the parents said, the mother said on the, on, the, on the video that when the son went and complained to the, one of the teachers, she laughed. Like that's something to, to laugh about. A child went to complain and said he was almost sexually assaulted by um, other males, right? She found that funny. She found that funny. Some of y'all aren't fit to be teachers. I'm going to say it. Some of y'all are not fit to be teachers. Y'all go and do, um, do work in a hair salon and open some local some business or some food business or do something that you like. Because it makes no sense. With, um, you all are applying for teaching job and every day y'all crying out. Y'all don't want to be in school. The children are giving y'all hard, a hard time. Children are difficult to deal with. Children are difficult to deal with, whether they're in school, they're at home. Children need guidance. They need eyes on them at all times. And you have to do whatever is necessary to protect them. Because if you leave a child unattended or um, for too long, they will do without any supervision. Children do whatever they want. That is where we come in, our wisdom and our guidance and our direction for them, and our prayers as well. How, what are we doing? What else are we here waiting to hear happen in the school system? I think personally, there should be police on guard at all times at school, all day. They should be there from in the seven o'clock in the morning, matter of fact, or when the shift, when shift starts, they should be there all day long. Because the children are walking with weapons, all kind of things going 
are now. School is not school anymore. Why must parents be in fear to send their children to school? You might, you might as well um, legalize um, homeschooling. I don't mind homeschooling my children because if, if these are the things that I'm going to have to be worrying about and concerned about and be fearful about. You might as well because a lot of parents are, are, are thinking about homeschooling. Matter of fact, I know quite a, um, some parents already who are homeschooling. So y'all yeah, need to let this be an option because ain't nobody gonna want to send their children to school and hear all of these things happening to them. So I do hope that a minister of education can look into this and see what is going on. More attention needs to be paid into the school system in, in terms of bullying. There's a system that needs to be in place. There are penalties that need to be in place. And there, there has to be consequences and penalties for this kind of behavior. And also get the children some help. Every school should have a guidance counselor. Every school should have pastors going in every week to counsel these children. That should be one thing that is available. Counseling. Yeah, they are playing. They are playing with this internet. You know how much harm this internet do to our children? Yeah, playing. Put system in place. The children are the future for this nation, for the entire world. We're going to die out and go on we waiting. Who we leave it to run this world? A pack of bullies? Children, helpless children who can't help themselves? I'm going to read this one too. Bandit fatally chopped after robbery at Port Moran. Pardon me, robbery of Port Moran Goldsmith. This is something in Starbrook News yesterday. Hear what it says. A bandit died yesterday after being fatally shot, chopped in the Portland market after he had accomplice had robbed a goldsmith. The police last night identified the dead bandit as 18-year-old permanent portab called Mikey. They both, the robbery occurred at about 9.15 a.m. Initial investigations revealed that the businessman 31 went to his jewelry store at about 7.30 a.m. And about 9.15, he was punched upon by the bandits while attending to customers. Potab had a cutlass and his accomplice had a gun. The businessman's employee was injured after he was attacked with the cutlass. The bandit with the gun made the jewelry, made the jeweler lie on the ground and grabbed jewelry and stuffed it into a blue drawstring bag. The businessman raised an alarm and persons in the market confronted the bandits. The gunman discharged three rounds in the in their direction, hitting one of the persons on his right leg and left thigh. Potab was confronted by several persons in the market who managed to disarm him, take away the bag, and handed it over to the police. All items stolen by the bandits were recovered and accounted for. Subsequently, subsequently, Potab sustained several wounds about his body, causing him to fall to the ground. The person who suffered the gunshot wounds and Potab was were rushed to the Port Morant Hospital where they both were seen by a doctor on duty. Potab succumbed to his injuries while receiving medical attention. Um, the man who was shot for, was treated and he took his own discharge. The body of Potab was examined by the police and it was observed that he had one sharp wound to his right hand and two to his upper back. So, bandit, a note, you know, note the, is, is, um, the, the bandit is permanent Potab. And let, let me bring in Mr. Canvey, Pavanam Patel Bandit. So people, it's not one set of people, um, the Steve. You know, CC is not one. So they just want to give the impression that there's only one set of people, um, the Steve. It is not, it is not so. We know that it's not. So, so true, you know. And um, because when I when I saw the name, I had to ask the question, hey, is this, could we judge him by by, by, by the name, you know? I, I, I wanted to, hey, is, is a different set of people committing robbery now, you know? But you know, that's how it is. That's how it is. That's how it is. You know, and um, let me say this now. We as we move on, CC. We spoke some time ago about the um the Guyanese critic being charged with um inflicting grievous what was the charge? The, 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 the um he was charged inflicting grievous bodily harm 
on a man by the name of Brian, Brian Passat. Both of them are charged. And the question is asked, because up to now they have not answered it, have they initiated the process to take away the gun, the license, to revoke the license it, issued to critic? And have they lodged that firearm as an exhibit in this case? Because the allegation is that the firearm was used to inflict the grievous body arm um, or bodily arm on Brian Passat. They have not answered. And I would hope that the, the journalists and these reporters will ask them, what is the position with the firearm license uh, or the firearm itself that critic used to assault this man? He's alleged to have assaulted him with the firearm. What is the position? Now we're going to continue to ask questions. We're going to continue to ask these questions. Mr. Conway, they, we asked it before. They have not responded. Well, they, we didn't ask them. But I have not seen any release to suggest that they have initiated, as they should do, a process to revoke this well, um, license and to have this firearm lodged and as, as an exhibit in this case. What is your take, my brother? Well, you know, it's a wall of silence. But then the thing is, um, how in heaven's name, critic was issued with a firearm? How is the heaven's name, the, 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 his, his behavior? The, the, the kind the kind of temperament that he displaying on television and elsewhere and you're gonna put a, a firearm in as my name and then to compound it allegation that he lash a man with a firearm nothing to say whether the firearm was large and then further to it if if that is true do the process write in him and ask him to show cause why 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 the firearm license should not be revoked but perhaps critic getting preferential treatment or critic is untouchable animal farm all animals are equal but some are more equal than others but this is also a straightforward case the man has a firearm license all right he's alleged to have used it to assault a man the matter uh he is charged the other man is charged it's, it is automatic that that firearm is lodged as in the first instance as, as an exhibit and while it is there as an exhibit in this case, you initiate the process to, for him to explain. You can't just, let me tell you all again, you can't just take away the man gun just like that. There is a process. He has to be written to and asked to show cause why the firearm license issued to him in respect to the same fire should not be revoked. Give him chance to answer. Give him chance to explain himself. Natural justice. So I am hoping that they will do the right thing you know we continue to come here and we advise them what is the correct procedure and i hope that they are listening hope you have, if you take it now you have every reason to take it now but you take it now because it is large as an exhibit you should have large at the same time as an exhibit when the complaint was made that he used it to solve the man it should have been large and then after you you carry during the post of the inve um, investigation the commander is have to write him to him to show cause why this firearm license should not be revoked. I hope they do the right thing. As, as CC said, do animal farm. So all animals are equal. 31 year old business committed on a 31 year old businessman at Port Moran quarantine Barbies of a quantity of gold and silver jewelry. The incident occurred on the 24th, uh, 20, 26th at about 9 15 hours. This is why Port Moran Market was in swing now. At Port Moran Market. Yeah, yeah. By the Port Moran Market always have police. Port Moran always have police present. By permanent part time. Four five police present. Called Mickey, yeah. deceased, an eighteen-year-old male of Lot Four, the Five Hampshire Village, quarantine Barbies, who was armed with a cutlass and one male identi identifiable male armed with a handgun. Have they been able to apprehend um, part uh partner in crime? You know Harbor I think they did that. Okay. Initial no, investigations didn't. revealed that the businessman who operates a jewelry shop inside Port Morant Market went to his shop at 7.30 where on arrival he opened for business and at about 9.15 they were pounced upon by the bandits while attending to customers. Pertab armed with a cutlass in his hand started a Deal several lashes about the body of the businessman assistant with the cutlass. 
businessman's assistant with the cutlass, causing him to receive injuries. So there's not a businessman, he has his assistant. The other bandit who was armed with a handgun ran up and told them to lie down on the ground, and they both complied. The bandit then looted several cases of jewelry into a blue string bag, blue STR, blue string bag, a blue and made good their escape on foot. The businessman raised an alarm and the persons in the market confronted the bandits who discharged three rungs in their direction, hitting one of the persons on his right leg and left thigh. Partab, who was armed with a cutlass and had the blue bag with the stolen jewelry, was confronted by several persons in the market who managed to disarm him, take the bag away, and handed it over to the police. And handed it it over to the police handed it over this the bag right let me see yeah. all items stolen by the bandits were recovered and accounted for subsequently partab received several wounds about his body causing him to fall to the ground so he just maybe run into person so not the fact that people attacked him right he just received these wounds like jesus is just torn up when he there's there's a police report you know Subsequently, police report again, twist already here. Yeah, yes, sir. this is fuckery. How you receive, um, um, subsequently, Partab received several wounds about his body, causing him to fall to the ground. Mark Lovell, who received the gunshot wound, and Partab were rushed to the Port Morant public hospital where they were both seen and examined by doctors on duty. Part Partab succumbed to his injuries while receiving medical treatment. Mark Lovell was treated for his gunshot wound and took self-discharge. The body of Partab was examined by police and was observed that he had one chap wound to his right hand and two to his upper back. The body of Partab was then escorted to Ramu Funeral Home waiting for a post-mortem examination. I'm hoping the police are working and getting um, these people. The system can't work like that. And yeah. that's the thing. I mean, if, if that video you have, I show the commander, the commissioner, as you look at that video, right? And that's what they come up His dad called me. And I hear him talking, talking, talking. So I said his phone, like it pressed in his pocket, so I cut off the phone. And then after he called back again and he said, babe. I said, yes. He said, where are you? I said, home. He said, I'm calling you, you answer. I said, I answer you, but you weren't hearing me. He said, baby, I'm... man, chop up my keys. And I run in the house and I said, no, no. Give me my key. Give me my key. Run inside the house, he brought up. He brought up, asked me, mommy, what happened? He come out from my room. He said, mommy, what happened? I said, I chop up my key, man. When I reach, the police office, the, the chief load the police coming out from the hospital, my husband with his car and one officer. So I asked him where we going, he said they have to come and search the home. So I just said, okay, let them come. And he said, well, Vicky is there, that's my other son. I go, I stand there, I ask him. And I said, Vicky, you see your brother? He said, no. The police said, oh, we can't go and see if he could do the noise, then walk. So I said, I want to see my son. They said, my son is at um, under investigation and I can see him. I sit there and my husband called me back. He said, baby, you went and see my kids for them and allowing me to go and see my kids. I called him to the office. My key already. So I jump up and I said, no. I said, I want to see my son. And by the time I was speaking to him, the nurse opened the emergency door on the hospital and she asked my son if he daddy there because my husband was there all the time. He's the one who pick he up, he can move body. <laughs> if the pick the one is the left oh, the the baby there. <laughs> he pick he up, he police throw he inside the pick up and my husband drive behind them and when they reach hospital, they may have 
support of a carry in their hospital. My husband at the high and put him a stretcher in the hospital. <laughs> Mikey, the last that I know of, Mikey said he working with R. R does do construction work, he does work he as a laborer right over the road. Our house is where Mikey does the majority of the days. Nobody in perfect, nobody in perfect. But how oh, then could I catch him and then could I put two lashes in him and could I tie him up and give it to them? <laughs> could I go? He gonna spend his time and he gonna come with the technology he wanna change but <laughs> them more than me back there and then take a blood for the child. <laughs> now he's on my child, now me belly. <laughs> now me baby. Nobody natural and bad one. <laughs> Nobody good one. <laughs> When they did that to my son, he had not no weapon in his hand. He dropped every single thing and he run. Oh, he run. They could have catch him and they could have put lash in him. But... Yes. On his right hand, it nearly chop off, you can feel that the bone is chopped. On his hand here, chop. He had a little one here. When according to the doctor report that I received yesterday, he said there is two chop wounds to the back. One lower and one on top. I haven't get I haven't gotten to see it because he was lying on his back on the 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 trauma bed, as they call it, the trauma bed. So, excuse me. He was lying on his back. I could not have seen those wounds. Um, he looked like he had hard chop in his head, but he hair thick. I ain't gonna know the. No, I ain't see it yesterday, but I don't know. It is alleged that the New York City Police Department and federal law enforcement are investigating a crime at the home of the president of the Caribbean Guyana Institute for Democracy, CGID, Rickford Burke, between October 27 and 28. The incident is believed to be an attempted international terrorist act sponsored by the People's Progressive Party government of Guyana. The PPP government continues to commit transnational repression crimes against African Guyanese in the U.S., who criticize its rampant corruption and racial discrimination against African Guyanese. CGID warns the PPP government and their operatives in New York City that security around Mr. Burke will not hesitate to execute the use of force policy to protect Mr. Burke, his family and property. A 20-year-old man who was reportedly stopped by police for not wearing a helmet was allegedly slapped by a rank after he reportedly refused to pay a bribe on last Wednesday in the vicinity of La Parfait Harmony, West Bank Demerara, WBD. The 20-year-old man of Puderoyan WBD, who wishes to remain anonymous, stated the incident occurred between 1935 and 2030 Ash on October 23, 2024. The man who was the pillion rider at the time police stopped him told Kayatir News, they say police I got past something and I say, no, me ain't got duh. And them say, I gotta go in the station. But I say the bike can't go in the station because we get papers for the bike. The man recalled that one of the officers, a female come out and she's saying, y'all gotta know what y'all gotta do. Put the bike in the station because they want bribe and we ain't got no money on we cause I broke. The young man told Kater News that prior to being slapped, a male officer pushed him in his stomach with a baton. The officer didn't feel pleased with it, so he scrambled me by my pants and dragged me and carried me in the station, the 20-year-old said. Upon entering the station, the man alleged that he was placed on a bench, and shortly thereafter, an argument ensued between him and the officer, which resulted in him being slapped. Me ain't hit the police. 
Me ain't cussed the police or nothing, just a talking alone we had. And when we reach inside day police station, he raise he hand and slap me. One slap he rest pon me, just sa, uh, the frustrated man told Kayater News. The young man said that while sitting on the bench, he started to record the police officer who slapped him. However, the cop saw him recording him and allegedly forced him to delete the video. The man said that the police reportedly told him, if I see any video inside death, you gonna face the consequences. He run me phone, run see the video, tell me to delete the video. I had to delete the video, the young man said while noting that he was only released from the police station after completing a statement. I say, all right, good, I going home and I going to the hospital because me face swell up and it hurting me. Since when I went inside of the station, I had meth face down because it hurting me. A report of the incident was made at the Vrenan Hoop police station. Three months after he was remanded to prison after being charged with the possession of firearms, ammunition and components of firearms, Eon Fagundes was granted bail on Monday. Fagundes, 46, was granted $350,000 for the possession of firearms, $150,000 for the possession of ammunition, and $150,000 for the possession of components of firearms. Bail was granted by Magistrate Fabio Azza after Fagundes' attorney, Cyan Durjan, made an impassioned appeal even though the prosecution opposed based on the gravity of the offenses and the strength of the evidence against Fagundes. Durjan, however, cited various medical issues experienced by Fagundes. The lawyer further stated that Fagundes had been in prison for some three months but yet trial could not begin as pertinent documents and materials requested had not yet been disclosed to the defendant. Fagon Ease was arrested on July 24, 2024 at his Sandy Bab Street, Kit, Georgetown home after police searched the premises and found over 26 high-powered rifles and handguns along with over 1,600 rounds of ammunition of different calibers. Fagundes, along with his mother, two sisters, a niece, and a handyman were also arrested following the discovery. The inventory included various firearms such as Sig Sauer, Ruger, FN-45, Smith & Wesson, Beretta, Springfield, Canik, and Glock models, each accompanied by corresponding magazines and ammunition rounds. In front, get it, no thing, man. In front, in front, in the middle. Rust the man with the pin. Lose this big one. Lose the fine one. Oh, soldier truck and then long this truck here, boy. What? What tight at the bottom of the spring? By the, by the wheel, by the spring, dive and go on on it. Them fucking tanks um, float in the truck, you know? Yeah. Them tank float in the truck. Yeah. Yeah, them tank. Eight butterfly sea moss powder. Take your daily routine to the next level. Natural vegan superfood powder, essential multivitamin powder made just for you. Hi to the 2025 elections and all of this because of Jack Dale's weekly tantrums. I caused them to have got momentum in their sale. It's just stupidity, but I suspect they, want, they hate this weekly tantrum that I throw here. The weekly tantrum, so he wants me to end the weekly tantrum so he could continue to lie about the PVP as they did in the past. Their argument was correct. Central Welfare Fund account number so, 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 L of the Republic Bank Limited to, to be used for the purpose of the payment of goods 
supplied to the Ghana police force. A purpose other than for which monies from the Ghana police force central welfare fund is to be used without any reasonable excuse and justification. What I say there, goods were supplied. They take the welfare money. 30 million, you get back to start to get 